morning. I'm bringing my watch up here. Um, I'll take the, uh, I, this is a time for questions from the audience. Maybe I'll ask a question while you're warming up and getting to the second page of your question. Uh, we, we prefer questions rather than addresses, but we'll take whatever you have. Um, you know, I was thinking uh, about um, the fact that, for example, the, the work that David presented uh, showing the outcomes for AMI, actually it depended upon a very rigorous uh, challenge of just getting those data. And reminded me, if you want to figure out some latent uh, variables or groups or identifiers in a study already done, it's very hard to get access to those data. And so I, I think that has to be something that uh, the folks on the panel should address. And this made me, this really seemed most obvious kind of in a backwards way when you think of basket trials. And that is when you think about people getting treatments for cancers, not based on the organ from which the cancer arises, but rather the molecular signature of it. And we would, if we didn't think about, imagine if you didn't know that signature, but you were just randomly treating people for, say, bowel cancer, breast cancer, and so forth, you would never think that this should work out. But now that we know that latent variable, which is, in fact, the molecular signature, we know that it's a very appropriate thing to do. Um, but in most cases, we won't know that information. The access to data and, and frankly, the pu public availability of such data seems like um, a terribly important f factor for advancing this field. And I wondered if the folks on the panel could uh, address that. Maybe just fix it for me. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I don't think your thing's on. Uh, you know, I know we have some experts actually open data in the audience. I don't know. Do you want to have like a one minute commercial? Like open data or a two minute commercial? Does that work now? Can you hear me? So uh, I'm, I'm Joe Ross I'm from Yale. I'm a primary care physician there. Uh, and um, on open data, I'll just say the word, you know, there's a lot of different clinical trials that are now being made available by sponsors, manufacturers, the NIH, for, for uh, secondary research purposes. So I lead something called the Yoda Project, the Yale Open Data Access Project. We partner with J&J. &J. Oh, there's Jesse. I th thought you were in that seat. Uh, making we have more than 250 clinical trials that J&J &J is making available for secondary uses. We review proposals that are submitted, and, and then, you know, David, your group has gotten data through us, and, you know, it's made available. But there's other groups as well. There's a large multi-sponsor platform uh, called clinicalstudydatarequest.com. It's GSK and Roche and a number of other companies making their clinical trial data available. Um, there's the NIH BioLink website, which is an extraordinary repository of uh, NHLBI data, uh, and there's others. Is that sufficient, or should I say more? Yeah, Bob, yeah, please, you have some data. Is there some way we can be sure that the mics are working? Maybe we could borrow one from a table. All right. Had about uh, had sa tumor samples in about a third of the patients, and went and did EG EGFR testing, and found overwhelmingly that all of the effect was in the EGFR positive, and there was no effect at all in the EGFR negatives. Well, if they hadn't had samples, they couldn't have done that. And you know, as we learn, that seems like something worth thinking about too. I assume you'll propose regulation about that. Yes, Ralph. Maybe you should introduce yourself, not that in this case. Oh, no, you want your mic back, I bet. There's a microphone on this. Oh, it's actually right here. All right, so this. That was not. So I had a, uh, often when we design therapeutic trials, it's, we begin with some sort of understanding of a mechanistic pathway and process that generates the original uh, design of the trial. And then you want to go, and we want to do a lot of these subgroup analyses looking for treatment heterogeneity. And we use statistical modeling to help us understand uh, the uh, presence of the um, uh, subgroup differences. To what extent do you think you need to have a mechanistic appreciation and understanding 
of those subgroup analyses, what are the criteria for inferring that these uh, are, in fact, not just associated uh, observations uh, related to certain characteristics of the patients, but have the same kind of meaning that Bob was referring to when he was trying to explain differences that were observed in uh, settings. So uh, are there criteria for inference making that extend beyond the modeling that uh, might identify some of these variations? So, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for Ralph, but I will pick up uh, on one point, and that is, you know, if you think, you know, one of the points I want to stress is kind of the scale dependence of heterogeneity of treatment effect. When we do our forest plots, we're always looking at the relative risk. But if you think of the absolute risk reduction as the most important clinical target, that's actually, it's a product of... Uh, the prognosis of the patient, of the, of the risk of the patient, multiplied by the relative risk. And it turns out those are equally important dimensions because it's just the product. And uh, the, the difference with, with going up the, the y-axis that Derek showed and going across the x-axis, which is prognosis, is that it's just so much harder to go up the y-axis. And it's harder for two reasons. One is you get at uh, one is that we, we often know very little, actually, about the relative effect modifiers before we go into the trial. Um, whereas we know a whole bunch about what predicts prognosis. I mean, we have so many predictive models in the literature, we don't know what to do with them. So that information is already available. The other problem, which is equally uh, severe, is that when we look up the uh, kind of uh, relative effect modification, we use you know, statistical interaction. And uh, you're just generally very poorly powered to look at statistical interaction. So those two things together will cause, you know, basically it causes those forest plots that Bob was speaking about to be so uh, unreliable. Uh, you know, and they're unreliable empirically, but also theoretically. We, ant we should anticipate that they're unreliable because they're very underpowered. And, you know, the prior information we have is typically very weak. So it's kind of weak theory, noisy data is an engine to generate unreliable uh, subgroups. Whereas for prognosis, we could actually uh, get a lot of the uh, heterogeneity on the, on the clinically important axis with a very reliable method of modeling. Can, can I just make a follow-up Sure. And then... And then uh, well, one of the other reasons, of course, is you may miss those is because a lot of the heterogeneity is outside of the trial, that uh, despite the FDA's constant imploring that we broaden the criteria for inclusion, uh, we continue to have relatively narrowly defined uh, trials. So a lot of the heterogeneity that we experience in clinical practice has never actually been included in the trials, and then we uh, are surprised when we don't see much variation in those forest plots. But if we actually study the people who were uh, the targets for the treatment, we may find that there's a lot of heterogeneity there. Do you have particular areas of heterogeneity in mind? Other diseases, other drugs? What do you, what do you think is omitted? So, uh, one often cited example is the medicine Monte Lucast, uh, leukotriene receptor antagonist, that you know, patients love. Uh, uh, most of us in clinical practice were skeptical about, thought it was inferior to beta agonists and steroids in managing asthma. But actually, when it was uh, studied in pragmatic trials, it turned out to be highly effective. Patients took it. Uh, they, uh, many of the patients who were, uh, uh, who were responsive to the monolucast were not included in the original uh, comparison trials. So, uh, you know, there are lots of reasons why there's heterogeneity out there that is not included in the original trials. So you'd like to see more inclusion of whatever background drugs they were on in the first place and not exclude yeah. them, not exclude them because of that. Yeah, if you would allow me, Bob, I'd be happy to come and give you a whole array of things. Yeah, like okay. No, I think, we're, in the I think we're very sympathetic. We would like to see the background drugs that people were on kept in the study, or at least some of the studies. Because you learn. 
I just wanted to, um, when I was giving, <clears throat> I had imagined that David would have taken more time to make the case for getting rid of the one at a time subgroup analysis. So I don't want anyone to think that I was uh, uh, advocating more for only having putative um, uh, predictive biomarkers. I would actually, I'm sort of vaguely ill by the forest plots. Uh, I, I would actually have a smaller for forest plot, but strongly endorse uh, a multi-attribute uh, risk model of your best understanding of predicting the outcome of disease, even though you might be wrong about mechanism and have that be absolutely mandated in every large phase three trial as a minimum, even if nothing else happens today, the sort of the, the death of the one at a time subgroup analysis would be great. But you can, you can there's nothing that stops you from grouping things in a forest plot. You can use agent sets uh, and any other five things you want. It's, well, it's about getting, a, I think it's the scale issue. You, you have to get across the entire risk. That I'd love to take a whole day for this, this panel, but I think, John, you were next. So, uh, John, please introduce yourself. Yeah, from right. Kansas City. Um, so, first of all, you know, I, I've been a real disciple of Rod and David and Peter's work in uh, taking lots of data from old clinical trials or open access data that that uh, people now have access to, like the Sprint trial, and running the models of heterogeneity of treatment benefit. But what strikes me is that this ought to be a mandate for the initial release of the clinical trials that, you know, when we, you know, our pathway to actually changing care is to do the trials and have them summarized in guidelines and then hope eventually people read them or they get endorsed to the performance measures. And what I can't understand is why when a major trial is released, there's not an online calculator so that you can apply the results from that evidence of that trial to the patient before you. And you know, to me, we've done enough work on the methodology, and it's time to make a call. The FDA could mandate this. Insurers could say we'll pay differently for patients who get more benefit or less. But when that clinical trial is released and published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that's the time to orient the medical community to this concept. And so one thing that would be great would be to hear from the panel, you're all going to say that's important, yes, we should do that, I can see the nodding heads, but how are you going to make that happen? How are we going to start to you know, create a call? And I know, you know I'm working with Frank on the ischemia trial, a major investment of the NIH, and this is baked right into the initial uh, you know, papers and publications that come out, and I'm just hoping hoping that we can work fast enough that when it's presented at the ACC or AHA or whatever, there's an online calculator that somebody can go back and actually really understand the benefits and engage their patients in shared decision making. Oh, great. I think there was somebody back here who was next. Oh, or not. Okay. Uh, go, uh, Ralph, go ahead. I'm sorry, Steve. We'll let the, the, the uh, frequent just go I first and then the baby. I didn't answer. think I looked anything like Ralph, although I didn't know which Ralph you're referring to. Well, I'm going oh, to endorse. Ralph back there. I'm huh? going to endorse the other Ralph also. Oh. But <laughs> I want to ask you, I'm not following some of these arguments. Are we, is the idea that we shouldn't look at forest plots, or is the idea we should put them there but be careful of how one interprets it? Because I've been. I'm in the New England Journal of Medicine in terms of it. I've had many studies that have come to me where they didn't have the forest plots, and we say, look at it, and suddenly you find these bizarre things. And I think it's kind of useful to say in the paper, we didn't control for multiplicity, we have these confidence intervals, and this is what the data is showing, as opposed to say you shouldn't look at it. I'm just not clear on how you can ignore a concern about maybe that males are different than females, maybe whites are different than blacks. I was involved with the aspirin one. I was on the panel when we were facing this aspirin difference and so forth. The, and Europe had, I think we, the U.S., I guess, if I recall, had the higher dose of aspirin. And we pondered that and pondered that. Should we ignore, ignore that? I mean, never know that, that that was the case. And there we sorted it out with the Capri trial it was, there was a situation of what kind of cardiovascular condition you had begin, to begin with, and one was showing results and strokes and MIs weren't and so forth. And we looked at that and we said, well, you know, scratch your head a bit. We don't think that the data is real and so forth. and had enough evidence to say that the clopidogrel was a good drug to use. And so I'm, I'm concerned about it, number one, on that, that we just, you know, we, we were facing this as if we were fighting 
religious law and getting rid of these <laughs> subgroups and what have you. I think we need to be looked at with care. The other thing is I'm, on the other side, is I'm all for predictive models. I, a good part of my life is developing predictive models. But when I do the clinical trials, I do a fair amount of clinical trials, the range of the variables is so damn tight that what are you going to be predicting? I mean, you know, the, like if you, you're looking for blood pressure medication, you're not going to be putting people in a trial that have a blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of 110. You're going to be putting them in there have a systolic blood pressure of 150. And so, so one of the most important variables <coughs> in the world is going to have a very narrow range. And so I'm not sure that if taking a, or developing a predictive model within the data, within the clinical trial, is going to be an, an easy way and a natural way and also taking the predictive model that was developed for other reasons and applying it. I mean, I think that it's a good idea, but I think we have a lot, a lot more hurdles to face. Um, uh, the, one of our panelists, I, I appreciate the panelists in the room as well as up here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Respond. Uh, to the last two comments, Ralph's comment. To me, there's nothing wrong with the forest plots. They're fine, they're exploratory. But these trials, they're, they're so expensive, they take so long that people want to do something. Look at Sprint. Look at the confusion between the generalists and the cardiologists. Uh, the, the reason is they want the predictive models in there so that the, so that the science, so the notice there's more, how should we say, more certainty and more about uh, how to yeah, deal you know, with I'm, all, I'm all for predictive models. I mean, yeah. if I took predictive models out of my life, I would have a bleak life. <laughs> no, I'm all for them. We're sympathetic. It, yeah, I'm all for them. It's just that I don't think we should throw out the. Okay. Sure. But let me let me let me comment on one one more comment and on then John's. I'm wondering how we're going to implement. Right. The Plus, I have to wave models. my watch at y'all. Okay. On John's point, which is that uh, <clears throat> oft times there's 50 variables, but if they were crunched well beforehand, as people up here have talked about. Uh, you could have three or four variables in a parsimonious trial. Yes, there might be a few left out, but there's so much collinearity uh, uh, that, that uh, the exercise would be to reduce it in a multivariate way to three or four manageable variables. Steve. Hi, uh, Steve Goodman from Stanford. Um, I just wanted to ask how uh, taking out the, um, uh, the segment of the clinical trial population that actually might be uh, experiencing net harm. So let, let's just assume that we have this gradation, which you can show in virtually every trial, of small benefit to large benefit, um, if, if, if there's net benefit. How do you avoid the sort of Jeffrey Rose prudential paradox that if you only target those with greatest benefit, you actually may be removing the majority of the benefit to, of, of the population that you're treating. That is, you get more net benefit from the 90% with small benefit than the 10% with large benefit. So when we're talking about this, we need to be careful. I, I'd just like to get your thoughts on that. I'm, I'm actually, uh, Rod wrote a paper on this. So yeah, think, that, uh, uh, actually we redid Jeffrey Rose's analyses. Uh, Jeffrey Rose was basing it upon your blood pressure or lipids. When you repeat his analysis, basing it on overall multivariable risk, you, it, it goes away. So it was the idea of looking at a single risk factor, the one at a time variable analysis. So Rose was right, you shouldn't just look at blood pressure or lipids, you need to look at overall risk. And that whole phenomenon is based upon not using a multivariable approach. I did want to talk, um, uh, respond to Ralph's, because I don't think this should be a controversy. You can't get away from high priors. I wouldn't say mechanism. Mechanism might give you a high prior, but past experience can. And this big data issue that we can get away from priors, and because we have big data or we have new methods, is wrong. It's provably wrong. You could have your forest plot in an appendix saying only researchers should pay attention to this for the next time they look because the prior might be higher. That's what um, Fisher proposed the p-value for, is you get a positive p-value, now that factor's worth looking at in the future, not that the p-value magically makes it. So we have a mechanism. You need a high prior to look at these things. 
Sometimes we have a mechanism, sometimes not. I mean, I don't know exactly why age does so many bad things to us, um, but, uh, but we have plenty of evidence it belongs in most models, right? Uh, and so it's better if we know the mechanism, but you just need past empirical evidence, good mechanism and theory, and underlying that statistically is a reasonable prior for all your primary analyses Exploratory analyses, journals give us huge appendices now. You could put it there for other researchers, but do not put it in the main paper, confusing readers and clinicians that it's actionable and that it was a good hypothesis testing, oh, personal opinion. Uh, Y'all, we're at the end of our time. I'm gonna, there's two hands that have come up here a lot. I'm gonna ask them to, to aim for concision. Uh, but, and then, and then we, we really should end, only because there's another, uh, you all want this break after uh, you sit down in about now 12 minutes. Hi, Anil Banwas, University of Washington. Very, very interesting discussion. Uh, my, my point about um, all these is, is the context of decision making, which is not brought about. The regulatory trials have a very different decision making context than comparative effectiveness trial. And maybe we can all agree that HTE is more important in the comparative effectiveness um, context because it informs individual clinical decision making. Um, so if, if HTE is the goal, I wonder why we are doing these big trials that are designed to actually you know, establish average effects. And if HT is a hypothesis generation exercise, which, is, which it is uh, at the beginning, uh, why are we spending so much money to generate hypotheses from trials and not do it from observational data and then follow it up with con confirmatory trials? I guess we're waiting for Frank. I'll just say, you know, propensity scores can't cure everything. Well, <laughs> propensity score is not the only observational methods that are out there. Yes. Uh, Frank. Frank Harold Vanderbilt University and FDA Cedar. Uh, I disagree with what you just said, but let's talk at the break. Uh, two points. I think the uh, forest plots are almost always misleading because they're not model-based, and you can show that, um, that you need to base the forest plots on very careful estimates. Uh, second of all, I think the panel has gotten too comfortable with uh, making an improvement over the way things used to, do, used to go with one variable at a time subgrouping that they're starting to make the same mistake with the uh, generalized risk estimation. So I saw multiple graphs uh, dividing risk into tertiles or quartiles, and uh, that really creates artifacts demonstrably. Uh, so if your risk model has any continuous variable in it, such as age, risk has to be continuous, and any attempt to break it is going to create artifacts and, and false boundary conditions um, and I think uh, to model risk as continuous, uh, you'll, you'll also not need nearly the sample size that some of the speakers implies that you, that you need. So I would just urge anyone not to create artificial uh, boundaries. And, and one of the other ways to say that is that when you're creating quartiles of risk, you're letting the entry criteria drive the biologic conclusion. So just by enrolling more young people, you're cha you'll change the risk quartile definition, and you'll change the overall estimate, estimate of the treatment effect in that quartile, and that's not medical, that's just demographic. Well, you know. Um, Could I respond to that? Just to yes, take okay. me a minute, I think. So, because I, I think Frank was criticizing my presentation. So, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll, I just agree with everything Frank said. Um, you know, I, we, we broke, broke it into quantiles really just to uh, display it beca because people like to see the observed outcomes rather than the modeled outcomes. But when we model, for example, the, the risk by treatment interaction, we use the linear predictor of risk by treatment. Um, the other point I think Frank is making is a very, it's a pretty subtle point because um, one of the major problems that when you use kind of quantile grouping, one of the major things that, that obscures is uh, the miscalibration of your model. So if you take a, a model that predicts risk and you, instead of breaking it up into quartiles, you break it up at the 5% mark, at the 10% mark, at the 15% mark, um, and you're using an external model, you will sometimes find really severe miscalibration 
um, that's obscured when you when you show it uh, by quantile. So I think that's a, it's a subtle point, but it's an important point, and I think it's a, a kind of an unresolved problem at this point. Um, well, so far we're keeping up with Joe's prediction that this would be the best meeting of, of the next 20 years. Um, I'd have to say the latent variable here that explains the heterogeneity of, of of the comments is really the Myers-Briggs uh, scale, especially the sensate to intuitive. And, and I, there's a lot of statisticians here and a lot of uh, uh, clinicians, so I assume that a lot of the work in the next several hours will be about bridging that gap as well. Uh, the next session in about 10 minutes will be an equation-free presentation of new methods for prediction of treatment benefit and model evaluation.